Hey everybody, it's Randy with Carkeology, and on today's video, I'm going to go through some of the historic paperwork that came with the twin-engine Honda CRX, or CRX squared, or CRX2, or whatever the hell you want to call it. In any case, fortunately, along with the purchase came the most spectacular pile of documentation that I've ever had with a car that's come into the lab here. It is super, super, super cool, and I can't wait to show it to you. So let's check it out. So I've spent a little time kind of going through this big box of stuff uh, and putting it all into sleeves so I can go through it all and share it with folks. But let's start out with the obvious, the Car and Driver magazine that the CRX Squared was on the cover of. So this was the whole goal with, uh, with Car and Driver, going to Honda saying, hey, this is what we want to do. We want to build a twin engine CRX. We'll give you lots of coverage. We'll put a CRX on the cover for your our thanks for uh, your efforts. And that's what happened. So they built the car. It was on the cover. Nice big article inside of there. And then when they went to phase two, um, they had another article here. So this is in October of 1985. They go through the project super synchronicity where they had put on the Mugen body kit and gone with the larger engines, Recaro seats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that also appeared in Car and Driver in 2012. May of 2012, there was a Where Are They Now uh, article in there, and it showed this car uh, in storage somewhere. And all of that's fine and dandy. These are things that are easily found. In fact, the first two I found on eBay. I knew what issues they were in. You could order that stuff up. And that's great to have that kind of history when you've got a car that has been in a magazine. you got to get coverage of it and so on and so forth. The most amazing stuff, though, is the stuff that cannot be made up. It cannot be replicated. It cannot be found on eBay. Stuff like the State of California new vehicle tag for when the car was first on the road. And if you read real close here, American Honda Corporation, it shows that this was a corporate car. This is not something that was sold to the public. This receipt right here, cashier's temporary receipt. I have a similar one of these from a Honda motorcycle that I've got in my collection that was also a press uh, vehicle. And so this is from Honda, and it's basically a temporary receipt uh, for the vehicle that came along with uh, the DMV documentation. Um, here's another cool piece. This is a copy of the certificate of origin from Honda for this specific car. Uh, and it shows the VIN number and stuff on there. This is a pretty early car, looking at the number, 1076 being the last four numbers. I believe that they were sequential from the start of production, so it would have been the 1076 CRX that went across the line fairly early. Looking at the door tag, it was uh, produced in, uh, uh, actually in 1983 as an 84 model. Anyway, going on through other stuff, here's another DMV, copy of DMV paperwork, shows Car and Driver Magazine as um, the owner at the time. Uh, there is also a bill of sale or a copy of a bill of sale from when Car and Driver sold the car to this gentleman here, George Veneris, who was the head of a company called the American Sunroof Company, uh, or ASC. Now, ASC did a lot of conversions on cars, making them into convertibles, did prototyping for the automotive industry, and I believe they even imported and exported different products for a car with seats, I think. I don't know. On and on and on. In any case, there's DMV paperwork here with George's name on it. He was in Manhattan Beach, and he was the one that basically bought the car post all the modifications, and he kept it there. Uh, there is more info there in regards to that. It had 5,765 miles on it at the time that George got a hold of it. Here's a letter from George uh, to Don Sherman from ASC uh, agreeing to purchase the car. This is in January of 1985. So it's interesting. They built the car in 1984 and early 85. Uh, they did the tests with it and that sort of thing. They ran 5,000 miles on it and then they sold it pretty quick. There's also copies of documentation, letters from Honda of America right there, which is fantastic. 
It also tells the story of how a car and driver did not register the car legally in their name during their ownership. So they basically skipped title and Honda had to bail them out through that. So that's kind of interesting. It was all straightforward and simple there. And, and eventually he got that info. There's also press release info on the Mugen body kits and stuff for the Civic and CRX. There's an original Mugen uh, uh, catalog. And in here it shows circled the body kit and the prices uh, for the cost for them of what went on to this car. Uh, here's a sales brochure from 1984 showing the Honda CRX. And that's fun to see. This is a copy of a letter um, or a note from Don Sherman from Car and Driver with Tom Elliott's name. Now, he was the vice president of sales operations for Honda Motor Company. And he was the guy that they courted with a letter saying, hey, we want to build this. So this is a rough draft of that letter, and it's fantastic to go through it and read it, where it talks about the interest and what's going on here, what they want to do with it. Starting point, 84 Honda CRX with less than 10,000 miles. This is a press car that I believe was a part of the car and driver um, fleet there, or they had access to automatic, so on and so forth. It's our intention to use as much of the existing structure as possible, uh, just to add necessary reinforcements to properly support the added powertrain, et cetera, et cetera. And then it goes into detail about the type of suspension setup using uh, adjustable proportioning valves, uh, so on and so forth. It got really deep into all that. One battery stock location, rear engine would have no alternator or AC compressor. Um, use of the automatic transmissions, so on and so forth, and kind of going through a bit of the science of what they thought was going to work. And then asking Honda for their participation in the project. So to apply the aforementioned CR CRX for the sum of a dollar. Now that was kind of industry standard. If uh, an auto manufacturer was going to give a car to uh, a publication for work, they wouldn't actually give it. They would just sell it to them for a buck. Uh, so title transfer to car and driver uh, to remove all responsibility from American Honda uh, while they do crazy things with it, like put in two friggin' engines and haul ass around town. Um, in any case, uh, to supply the spare parts and incidental stuff to complete the construction, so the extra engine, so on and so forth. And then what car and driver would give Honda in return. So... Um, you know, building and developing the machine. Um, construction would take place at Racing Beat in Anaheim, paying for expenses incurred in during instruction, except for the standard CRX parts, paying for normal expenses, fuel, etc., and then featuring the fruits of the labor in an upcoming issue of Car and Driver magazine. And then they would also offer Honda the opportunity to promote the car in auto show and racing circuits, uh, certainly has a potential as a crowd pleaser. Every attempt will be made to keep the rear area of the car both visible and attractive to the eye. And then once car and driver is done with it, it would most likely be sold to a private individual. However, American Honda would be given first right of refusal at a price that would cover the construction expenses incurred. So interesting. Give us the car, but if you guys want it, then you need to pay for all the work that we did. No doubt they passed on that, which is why it was sold privately to somebody. Uh, in any case, a uh, quick little plan timeline for this work to be done. Uh, editorial features, so on and so forth. And Honda said yes. So they ended up getting the car and car and driver went to work with uh, figuring out all the things they needed to figure out on it. They even threw out a, a little press release to the readers of Car and Driver, inviting them to help name the project. So win the Name the CD Project Twin Engine CRX Contest, go down in history, and uh, the winner will, uh, the name will adorn the car across the tail in very large letters, and so on and so forth. And the results of that came through two CRX ideas, double trouble, double duty, Double Jeopardy. None of these is any good, however. I don't know who originally coined it, but CRX squared is the best of them all. So this was submitted in um, at 115.85.
So, anyway, this was uh, right before they started going to press with it and so on and so forth. The car was already built at that point. Um, let's see. Here's a letter after they presented the car to Honda as a completed vehicle. So, this is January 2nd, 1985. So, the car was really completed in 1984, but the press didn't come out until 1985. So it talks about presentation day at the Honda headquarters and how everybody had a terrific time demonstrating the car to enthusiastic members of your organization. In any case, immediately they go right into it going as much as fun, as much fun as it was undertaking this. I think we've barely scratched the surface. We'd love to go further with the car and to do so, we need a bit more participation from American Honda. So here goes the sales pitch from car and driver to Honda to get them to pony up some more engines. So they talk about using the 1.6 liter dual overhead cam 16 valve engine that's introduced in Japan. Um, that would boost the total horsepower um, to up over 240. Uh, they also uh, talk here about, um, let's see, the SI motor for the, the 85 model. It's a 1.5 liter. That would boost things up, so on and so forth. Um, personally, they really wanted to go with the double overhead cam approach because it carries the CRX farther into the future. And quite frankly, it was the most badass motor. Choice is yours. Will it be two cam, four, et cetera, et cetera. And the results of it were that Honda ponied up with two wrecked Honda Accords with the 1.8 liter engine in there for it. In any case, uh, timeline here, so on and so forth, um, um, what is to be done and when it is to be shown to the world. Uh, here's a rough draft of that same letter. Kind of fun to see their little notes as they put it all together. Um, some of the basics, two-seater sports car, four-wheel drive, two axles separately driven, front wheel drive, et cetera, et cetera, all of this. So this is when they have nailed down what they're putting into the car. This is the engine type 827, 1.8 liter with the K-Jet Tronic fuel injection. Uh, we're looking at a little over 100 horsepower for each of those. Um, let's see, powertrain, uh, independent suspension, curb weight, et cetera, et cetera. So, this is a rough draft of the article that was published in Car and Driver magazine, um, kind of talking about all of the craziness of it. And I believe this is the second article with the 1.8 liter engine in there. Um, and all of this is uh, kind of fun to read through, see the corrections, see the additions, and uh, the rough draft of that. Uh, let's see. Let's get into some other stuff here. Um, Lots of documentation here, which is just spectacular. And again, I've never had a car that's had this level of documentation behind it. Um, this shows some of the parts that were used in its second conversion. The Mugen panels, custom steering wheel, Sony CD player, Recaro seats, 15-inch um, wheels, 195-50-15 tires, uh, Coney shocks, uh, anti-roll bars, etc., etc., new rear nameplate and things like that. So they also look at uh, gear ratios and speed. Some info on the Honda Accord engines that were used in that. Let's see, Recaro model KRX uh, cloth uh, seats specifically for this car with flat woven wool in the center. So Recaro provided a set of their KRX seats that were made specifically for the project and those remain in the car today. Uh, more info here, torsion bars, cooling system, just different different little notes um, to the crew. Uh, notes called George, whoever George is, uh, tire sizes, so on and so forth. Um, let's see, body and paint for doing the, uh, uh, the logo on the back as well as uh, the 
different painting there. It looks like that work was done at Orange Body and Paint right on Collins Avenue in Orange. I've driven by there a million times. Uh, the steering wheel choice here, a personal Fashion Force steering wheel. I think that may be the one that's still in there. Uh, the wheels that were chosen for it for the article, these MSW Type 5s, shows the different choices of wheel sizes that were available there. They ended up going with the 15s. Um, other notes of people to call, Jackson Racing pops up, which is fun because I've spoken with Os Oscar Jackson recently about the project, and it's going to be fun to bring it back to him and give him a chance to drive the car again. Uh, brakes, etc. The autometer gauges that are in the center console shows all the part numbers, and of course, two of each for that. Um, the radiator, custom radiator with the inlets and outlets for two different uh, engines. Uh, now the receipts from Racing Beat. So this shows the costs involved with doing the conversion by Racing Beat back in the day. So this one here, this is the first time through, is about 8700 $8, bucks. Then some additional work here, $671, so on and so forth. And then here's an invoice that shows everything that was done to it through both stages. This is one that was submitted to the car and driver, um, bean counter so they knew exactly what was spent on this shows a total of $23,766.84. Now this is $1984, $1985. That's a crap ton of money to make a wacky car out of a little Honda CRX. But this is what the fun was all about. This is great here, this particular one here, because it names out all the people from Racing Beat that were involved with the build of the car. So I don't know if you recognize any of those names there. I don't necessarily, but I think other than Don Sherman from Car and Driver, but um, anyway, these are the crazy folks that were behind making this thing happen. And it might be fun to try to track down as many of those folks as possible and get them there. Anyway, here's a letter to CBS, who was the parent company for Car and Driver at the time, talking about the check and invoice, uh, the car being sold, um, inner office memorandum here, checks for different things. Um, let's see, here's some notes, stock modified, different speed stuff. Here's a little note when they were setting up the suspension to see how well it would do and talking about understeer under power in both directions and how you got to be careful a slight lift and the uh, attitude of the car is easily controlled and a note from the previous owner that he found that out so left turn watch the out so anyway when this thing gets up and running i can't wait to drive it this little note here is from john sherman to joe the previous owner of the car now don came down to see the car this is just a few years back uh, and after seeing it, meeting him, he realized that the best home for the, all the materials from the magazine was going to be with Joe and with the car. And he also says here, I know you'll take better care than we have of this paperwork. Keep them with the car and give them back to me when you sell it to me. So Don Sherman really wanted to buy this car himself, but Joe told him that his offer was just a bit too low to make that happen. Fortunately, all of the documentation Joe was willing to give me with the car. And hopefully Mr. Sherman is happy with that because I want to share this with as many people as possible because it's a fantastic archive of what went into this project, both from the build point of view, but also from the magazine point of view and the layouts of all of that sort of stuff. So here's a few things that actually still fit into uh, these sleeves different uh, cutaway drawings and illustrations and stuff in regards to the uh, the shape of the car for the magazine cover and things, uh, other sort of things. Uh, this is a cool little uh, transparency or, or print, uh, line drawing print of one of the engines. Um, and let me bring out a couple of the things that won't fit into, into that thing here that I... I've, some of this I'd love to get framed. Um, these are some of the illustrations that were actually used on the cover or used to create the cover for the magazine. You can see a lot of this stuff was touched up by hand. This is all like 
hand drawn stuff. These are pencil drawings. This is long before computers for doing this level of illustration. And a lot of this stuff is basically a blueprint or at least a professional illustration of the creation of the car and what it was all about. I totally dig those pieces. I'd like to frame a couple of those if possible. And also in this file here, there's some more stuff that's really fun. Here's a period photo of the car taken in the workshop there. Uh, good old Polaroid image. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, here's a transparency of the design for the CRX squared logo that's on the rear panel of the car. Uh, there's other cool things. Let's see, this was great. This is fun. So this is corrections for the cover layout for the uh, the main cover of that. And that's super fun to see. Shows some of the drawings, little notes of changes that they want done to that so that it's more accurate. They really went into detail with that. Um, this one is super fun. This one's definitely going to get framed. A little color layout here of what they want to do with the cover. And this is all done in pen and marker. You know, this is really low tech, but this is the way things were happening back then. Uh, let's see, this is another cool piece. There's so many of them. I could sit here for an hour and share all this stuff with you, but I want to keep this video reasonably short. Another cool layout photo here. This has some texture to it, different pieces put on there. A little drawing here with the project info on it. Anyway, super cool stuff. Let's see, let's go on beyond that and we'll get into some of the rest of it here. Further history of the car. Um, let's see, this is more lists of things to do, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so now we're looking into some of the documentation that went back and forth with Don Sherman and, um, and the previous owner of the car that I got it from. So he told a lot about uh, the way the car drove, what he thought the value was, uh, history of it, and so on and so forth. Uh, Joe shared that he went by um, Racing Beat at one point to share the story with him, and so on and so forth. Really cool. And then I've got things put in here, some of the previous owner information here. This is when George Veneris had it. Um, there's a receipt here uh, from Coney for some shocks for it that it looks like car and driver paid for. And then info here on owner number three. So this is really interesting, and I've not tracked down much info on this guy yet, but Charlie Bailey from Lucasfilms apparently owned this car. Now, I did look him up. He does still exist. He was up in Northern California up until just recently, and then he moved up to Oregon or Washington State, I believe. And I'm trying to track him down to see if he has any photos or stories to share in regards to the CRX. But I have identified that he was a car guy. He was into that sort of stuff. And he's also somebody that was involved with doing um, work up at Industrial Light and Magic. He was a designer for Mattel Toys, et cetera, et cetera. And to think that he had his butt in the seat of this car and maybe blasted around some of the Lucasfilm guys is really super fun. Anyway, moving forward there, this is to Florida. Somehow the car ended up in Florida, and it was at this Golden Classics place. This is 1995, and this is when Joe, the previous owner, bought it. So looking through all of this, sales price was $11,000 plus your tax and so on and so forth. There's a deposit receipt for the $1,000 he put down on it, and this was in 1996. So Joe ponied up. He paid eleven grand for this thing back in 1995. Um, here's info there on that. The state of Florida receipt, uh, inspection stuff from Florida, uh, the title there for the car, which I need to put it into my name next. This is also dyno results that happened in Florida while the car was there. They did two different dyno runs for both the front engine and the rear engine, and the results of the dyno day were written up in an article in Grassroots Motorsports Magazine, um, which is really kind of fun as well. Um, let's see, here's a receipt from a Honda dealership for air filters. So this proves that the air filters that are in the car are factory Honda pieces. So it's a different one for the front and a different one for the rear. And it looks like those were replaced in 96. Um, other receipts here, tires, 
Uh, here's brake stuff. Uh, brakes were recently done, some more tire receipts, Florida registration slips, and so on and so forth. And then apparently it was also featured in a magazine over in England called Custom Car. Um, and this was in 1987. I'd love for any of my UK viewers to keep your eye open for this article. The CRX squared is on the cover, and I'd really like to get a real article uh, on that, not just a carbon copy of it. But that, along with two big folders full of other paperwork, there's catalogs from all the period suppliers back in the 80s. There's other articles and books on Honda CRX information and performance tuning. That all came with it. A massive file of absolutely amazing history on the CRX2 or CRX squared or Project Super Synchronicity, whatever you want to call it. In any case, that's the quick rundown of all the history. Um, I, as I find out any more information, I'll certainly share it with everybody. But uh, the next step here is to really get cranking on the car, get it up and running and driving and back to glory once again. In any case, I hope you enjoyed the quick little tour or 25 minute tour of all of the insane documentation from this car. Keep on digging them up and driving them, folks. And thank you so much for watching.